A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Chapter Four The Preparation. When the mail got successfully to Dover in the course of the forenoon, the head drawer at the Royal George Hotel opened the coach door as his custom was. He did it with some flourish of ceremony, for a mail journey from London in winter was an achievement to congratulate an adventurous traveller upon. By that time there was only one adventurous traveller left to be congratulated, for the other two had been set down at their respective roadside destinations. The mildewy inside of the coach, with its damp and dirty straw, its disagreeable smell, and its obscurity, was rather like a larger dog-kennel. Mr. Lorry, the passenger, shaking himself out of it in chains of straw, a tangle of shaggy wrapper, flapping hat, and muddy legs, was rather like a larger sort of dog. "'There will be a packet to Calais to-morrow, drawer?' "'Yes, sir, if the weather holds, and the wind sets tolerable fair. "'The tide'll serve pretty nicely at about two in the afternoon, sir. "'Bed, sir? I shall not go to bed until night, but I want a bedroom. "'And a barber. And then breakfast, sir. "'Yes, sir. That way, sir, if you please. Show Concord. "'Gentlemen's valise are not wanted to Concord. "'Pull off the gentlemen's boots in Concord. "'You'll find a fine sea-coal fire, sir.' Fetch Barber to Concord. Stir about there now for Concord. The Concord bedchamber being always assigned to a passenger by the mail, and passengers by the mail being always heavily wrapped up from head to foot, the room had the odd interest for the establishment of the Royal George that, although but one kind of man was seen to go into it, all kinds and varieties of men came out of it. Consequently, another drawer, and two porters, and several maids, and the landlady were all loitering, by accident, at the various points of the road between the Concord and the coffee-room, when a gentleman of sixty, formally dressed in a brown suit of clothes, pretty well worn, but very well kept, with large square cuffs and large flaps to the pockets, passed along on his way to his breakfast. The coffee-room had no other occupant that forenoon other than the gentleman in brown. His breakfast-table was drawn before the fire, and he sat with its light shining on him, waiting for the meal. He sat so still that he might have been sitting for his portrait. Very orderly and methodical he looked, with a hand on each knee, and a loud watch ticking a sonorous sermon under his flapped waistcoat as though it pitted its gravity and longevity against the levity and evanescence of the brisk fire. He had a good leg, and was a little vain of it, for his brown stockings fitted sleek and close, and were of a fine texture. His shoes and buckles, too, though plain, were trim. He wore an odd little sleek, crisp, flaxen wig, setting very close to his head, which wig, it is to be presumed, was made of hair, but which looked far more as though it were spun from filaments of silk or glass. His linen, though not of a fineness in accordance with his stockings, was as white as the tops of the waves that broke upon the neighboring beach, or the specks of sail that glinted in the sunlight far out at sea. A face habitually suppressed and quieted was still lighted up under the quaint wig by a pair of moist bright eyes that it must have cost their owner in years gone by some pains to drill to the composed and reserved expression of Telson's bank. He had a healthy color in his cheeks, and his face, though lined, bore few traces of anxiety. But perhaps the confidential bachelor clerks in Telson's bank were principally occupied with the cares of other people, and perhaps second-hand cares, like second-hand clothes, came easily off and on. Completing his resemblance to a man who was sitting for his portrait, Mr. Lorry dropped off to sleep. The arrival of his breakfast roused him, and he said to the drawer, as he moved his chair to it, I wish accommodation prepared for a young lady who may come here at any time to-day. She may ask for Mr. Jarvis Lorry, or she may only ask for a gentleman from Telson's Bank. Please to let me know. Yes, sir. Telson's Bank in London, sir? 
Yes. Yes, sir. We oftentimes the honour to entertain your gentlemen in their travelling backwards and forwards betwixt London and Paris, sir. A vast dealing of travelling, sir, in Telson and Company's house. Yes, we are quite a French house, as well as an English one. Yes, sir. Not much in the habit of travelling yourself, I think, sir. Not in late years. It is fifteen years since we, well, since I came last from France. Indeed, sir, I was before my time here, sir, before our people's time here, sir. The George was in other hands at that time, sir. I believe so. But I could hold a pretty wager, sir, that a house like Telson and Company was flourishing a matter of fifty, not to speak of fifteen years ago. You might say treble that, and say a hundred and fifty, and yet not be far from the truth. Indeed, sir! Rounding his mouth and both his eyes, as he stepped backward from the table, the waiter shifted his napkin from his right arm to his left, dropped into a comfortable attitude, and stood surveying the guest while he ate and drank, as from an observatory or watchtower, according to the immemorial usage of waiters in all ages. When Mr. Lorry had finished his breakfast, he went out for a stroll on the beach. The little, narrow, crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach, and ran its head into the chalk cliffs like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about, and the sea did what it liked, and what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town, and thundered at the cliffs, and brought the coast down madly. The air among the houses was of so strong a piscatory flavour that one might have supposed sick fish went up to be dipped into it, as sick people went down to be dipped into the sea. A little fishing was done in the port, and a quantity of strolling about by night and looking seaward, particularly at that times when the tide made and was near flood. Small tradesmen, who did no business whatever, sometimes unaccountably realized large fortunes, and it was remarkable that nobody in the neighborhood could endure a lamplighter. As the day declined into the afternoon and the air, which had been at intervals clear enough to allow the French coast to be seen, became again charged with mist and vapor, Mr. Lorry's thoughts seemed to cloud too. When it was dark, and he sat before the coffee-room fire awaiting his dinner as he had awaited his breakfast, his mind was busily digging, digging, digging in the live red coals. A bottle of good claret after dinner does a digger in the red coals no harm, otherwise then, as it has a tendency to throw him out of work. Mr. Lorry had been idle a long time and had just poured out his last glassful of wine with as complete an appearance of satisfaction as is ever to be found in an elderly gentleman of a fresh complexion who has got to the end of a bottle, when a rattling of wheels came up the narrow street and rumbled into the inn-yard. He set down his glass untouched. "'This is Mademoiselle,' said he. In a very few minutes the waiter came in to announce that Miss Manette had arrived from London and would be happy to see the gentleman from Telson's. So soon. Miss Manette had taken some refreshment on the road and required none then, and was extremely anxious to see the gentleman from Telson's immediately, if it suited his pleasure and convenience. The gentleman from Telson's had nothing left for it but to empty his glass with an air of stolid desperation settle his odd little flaxen wig at his ears, and follow the waiter to Miss Manette's apartment. It was a large, dark room, furnished in a funereal manner with black horsehair and loaded with heavy, dark tables. These had been oiled and oiled until the two tall candles on the table in the middle of the room were gloomily reflected on every leaf, as if they were buried in deep graves of black mahogany, and no light to speak of could be expected from them until they were dug out. The obscurity was so difficult to penetrate that Mr. Lorry, picking his way over the well-worn turkey carpet, supposed Miss Manette to be, for the moment, 
in some adjacent room, until, having got past the two tall candles, he saw, standing to receive him by the table between him and the fire, a young lady of not more than seventeen, in a riding cloak, and still holding her straw travelling hat by its ribbon in her hand. As his eyes rested on a short, slight, pretty figure, a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes that met his own with an inquiring look, and the forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of rifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity, or wonder, or alarm, or merely a bright fixed attention, though it included all four expressions. As his eyes rested on these things, a sudden vivid likeness passed before him, of a child whom he had held in his arms on a passage across that very channel one cold time, when the hail drifted heavily and the sea ran high. The likeness passed away, like a breath along the surface of the gaunt pier-glass behind her, on the frame which a hospital procession of negro cupids, several headless and all cripples, were offering black baskets of dead sea fruit to black divinities of the feminine gender, and he made his formal bow to Miss Manette. "'Pray take a seat, sir,' in a very clear and pleasant young voice, a little foreign in its accent, but a very little indeed. "'I kiss your hand, miss,' said Mr. Lorry, with the manners of an earlier date, as he made his formal bow again, and took his seat. "'I received a letter from the bank, sir, yesterday, informing me that some intelligence or discovery—the word is not material, miss, either word will do—respecting the small property of my poor father, whom I never saw, so long dead— Mr. Lorry moved in his chair and cast a troubled look toward the hospital procession of negro cupids, as if they had any help for anybody in their absurd baskets. Rendered it necessary that I should go to Paris, there to communicate with the gentleman of the bank so good as to be dispatched to Paris for the purpose. Myself. As I was prepared to hear, sir. She curtsied to him. Young ladies made curtsies these days with a pretty desire to convey to him that she felt how much older and wiser he was than she. He made her another bow. "'I replied to the bank, sir, that it was considered necessary by those who know that, and who are so kind as to advise me, that I should go to France, and that as I am an orphan and have no friend who could go with me, I should esteem it highly if I might be permitted to place myself during the journey under that worthy gentleman's protection. The gentleman had left London, but I think a messenger was sent after him to beg the favour of his waiting for me here. I was happy, said Mr. Lorry, to be entrusted with the charge. I shall be more happy to execute it. Sir, I thank you indeed. I thank you very gratefully. It was told me by the bank that the gentleman would explain to me the details of the business, and that I must prepare myself to find them of a surprising nature. I have done my best to prepare myself, and I naturally have a strong and eager interest to know what they are." "'Naturally,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Yes, I—' After a pause he added, again settling his crisp flaxen wig at the ears, "'It is very difficult to begin.' He did not begin, but in his indecision met her glance. The young forehead lifted itself into that singular expression, but it was pretty and uncharacteristic besides being singular, and she raised her hand as if with some involuntary action she caught at or stayed some passing shadow. "'Are you quite a stranger to me, sir?' Am I not? Mr. Lorry opened his hands and extended them outwards with an argumentative smile. Between the eyebrows and just over the little feminine nose, the line of which was as delicate and fine as it could possibly be, the expression deepened itself as she took her seat thoughtfully in the chair by which she had thitherto remained standing. He watched her as she mused, and, 
the moment she raised her eye again, went on. In your adopted country, I presume, I cannot do better than address you as a young English lady, Miss Manette? If you please, sir. Miss Manette, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to acquit myself of. In your reception of it, don't heed me any more than if I were a speaking machine. Truly, I am not much else. I will, with your leave, relate to you, miss, the story of one of our customers. Story? He seemed willfully to mistake the word she had repeated, when he added, in a hurry, Yes, customers. In the banking business we usually call our connection our customers. He was a French gentleman, a scientific gentleman, a man of great acquirements, a doctor. Not of Beauvais. Why, yes, of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of repute in Paris. I had the honor of knowing him there. Our relations were business relations, but confidential. I was at that time in our French house, and had been, oh, twenty years. At this time, may I ask, at, at what time, sir? I speak, miss, of twenty years ago. He married, an English lady, and I was one of the trustees. His affairs, like the affairs of many other French gentlemen and French families, were entirely in Telson's hands. In a similar way, I am, or have been, trustee of or another to scores of our customers. These are mere business relations, miss. There is no friendship in them, no particular interest, nothing like sentiment. I have passed from one to another in the course of my business life, just as I pass from one of our customers to another in the course of my business day. In short, I have no feelings. I am a mere machine. To go on. But this is my father's story, sir, and I begin to think— The curiously roughened forehead was very intent upon him. That when I was left an orphan, through my mother's surviving my father only two years, it was you who brought me to England. I am almost sure it was you. Mr. Lorry took the hesitating little hand that confidently advanced to take his, and he put it with some ceremony to his lips. He then conducted the young lady straight away to the chair again, and, holding the chair back with his left hand, and using his right by turns to rub his chin, pull his wig at the ears, or point what he said stood looking down into her face, while she sat looking up into his. Miss Manette, it was I. And you will see how truly I spoke of myself just now in saying I had no feelings, that all the relationship I hold with my fellow creatures are mere business relations, when you reflect that I have never seen you since. No, you have been a ward of Telson's house since, and I have been busy with the other business of Telson's house since. Feelings? I have no time for them, no chance of them. I pass my whole life, miss, in turning an immense pecuniary mangle. After this odd description of his daily routine of employment, Mr. Lorry flattened his flaxen wig upon his head with both hands, which was most unnecessary, for nothing could be flatter than its shining surface was before, and resumed his former attitude. So far, miss, as you have remarked, this is the story of your regretted father. Now comes the difference. If your father had not died when he did, don't be frightened. How you start? She did indeed start, and she caught his wrists with both her hands. Pray, said Mr. Lorry, in a soothing tone, bringing his left hand from back of the chair to lay it upon the supplicatory fingers that clasped him in so violent a tremble, pray control your agitation. A matter of business. As I was saying, her look so decomposed him that he stopped, wandered, and began anew. As I was saying, 
If Monsieur Manette had not died, if he had not suddenly and silently disappeared, if he had not been spirited away, if it had not been difficult to guess to what dreadful place, though no art could trace him, if he had an enemy and some compatriot who could exercise a privilege that I in my own time have known the boldest people afraid to speak of in a whisper across the water there, for instance, the privilege of filling up blank forms for the consignment of any one to the oblivion of a prison for any length of time. If his wife had implored the king, the queen, the court, the clergy for any tidings of him, and all quite in vain, then the history of your father would have been the history of this unfortunate gentleman, the doctor of Beauvais. I entreat you to tell me more, sir. I will. I am going to. Can you bear it? I can bear anything but the uncertainty you leave me in at this moment. You speak collectedly, and you are collected, that's good, though his manner was less satisfied than his words. A matter of business. Regard it as a matter of business, business that must be done. Now, if this doctor's wife, though a lady of great courage and spirit, had suffered so intensively from this cause before her little child was born— the little child was a daughter, sir. A daughter. A, a matter of business. Don't be distressed, miss. If the poor lady had suffered so intently before her little child was born, that she came to the determination of sparing the poor child the inheritance of any part of the agony she had known the pains of, by rearing her in the belief that her father was dead, no, don't kneel. In heaven's name, why should you kneel to me? For the truth. Oh, dear, good, compassionate sir, for the truth. Ah, a matter of business. You confuse me, and how can I transact business if I am confused? Let us be clear-headed. If you could kindly mention now, for instance, what nine times nine pence are, or how many shillings in twenty guineas, it would be so encouraging. I should be so much more at my ease about your state of mind. Without directly answering to this appeal, she sat so still then that, when he had gently raised her, and the hands that had not ceased to clasp his wrists were so much more steady than they had been, that she communicated some reassurance to Mr. Jarvis Lorry. That's right, that's right. Courage, business. You have business before you, useful business. Miss Manette, your mother took this course with you, and when she died, I believe broken-hearted, having never slackened her unavailing search for your father, she left you at two years old to grow to be blooming, beautiful, and happy without the dark cloud upon you of living in uncertainty where your father soon wore his heart out in prison, or wasted there through many lingering years. As he said the words, he looked down with an admiring pity on the flowing golden hair, as if he pictured to himself that it might have been already tinged with grey. You know that your parents had no great possession, and that what they had was secured to your mother and to you. There has been no new discovery of money or any other property but— He felt his wrist held closer— and he stopped. The expression in the forehead which had so particularly attracted his notice, and which was now immovable, had deepened into one of pain and horror. But he has been, been found. He is alive, greatly changed. It is too probable, almost a wreck. It is possible though we will hope the best, still alive. Your father has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there, I, to identify him, if I can, you to restore him to life, love, duty, rest, comfort. A shiver ran through her frame, and from it through his she said in a low, distinct, awe-stricken voice, as if she were saying it in a dream, "'I am going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not him.' 
Mr. Lorry quietly chafed the hands that held his arm. There, 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 see now, see now. The best and the worst are known to you now. You are well on your way to the poor wronged gentleman, and with a fair sea voyage and a fair land journey, you will soon be at his dear side. She repeated in the same tone, sunk to a whisper, I have been free. I have been happy, yet this ghost has never haunted me. Only one thing more, said Mr. Lorry, laying stress upon it as a wholesome means of enforcing her attentions. He has been found under another name, his own long forgotten or long concealed. It would be worse than useless now to inquire which, worse than useless to seek to know whether he has been for years overlooked or always designedly held prisoner. It would be worse than useless now to make any inquiries, because it would be dangerous. Better not to mention the subject, anywhere or in any way, and to remove him, for a while at all events, out of France. Even I, safe as an Englishman, and even Telson's, important as they are to French credit, avoid all naming of the matter. I carry about me not a scrap of writing openly referring to it. This is a secret service altogether. My credentials, entries, and memoranda are all comprehended in the one line, Recalled to life, which may mean anything. But what is the matter? She doesn't notice a word. Miss Manette! Perfectly still and silent, not even fallen back in her chair, she sat under his hand, utterly insensible, with her eyes open and fixed upon him, and with that last expression looking as if were carved or branded on her forehead. So close was her hold upon his arm that he feared to detach himself lest he should hurt her. Therefore he called out loudly for assistance without moving. A wild-looking woman, whom even in his agitation Mr. Lorry observed to be all of a red color, and to have red hair, and to be dressed in some extraordinarily tight-fitting fashion, and to have on her head a most wonderful bonnet, like a grenadier wooden measure, and good measure, too, or a great Stilton cheese, came running into the room in advance of the inn-servants, and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. "'I really think this must be a man,' was Mr. Lorry's breathless reflection, simultaneously with his coming up against the wall. "'Why, look at you all!' bawled this figure, addressing the inn-servants. "'Why don't you go and fetch things instead of standing there staring at me? "'I am not so much to look at, am I? "'Why not you go and fetch the thing? "'I'll let you know if you don't bring smelling salts, cold water, and vinegar. "'Quick, I will!' "'There was an immediate dispersal for these restoratives, "'and she softly laid the patient on a sofa, "'and tended her with great skill and gentleness, "'calling her, "'My precious and my bird, and spreading her golden hair aside over her shoulders with great pride and care. "'And you in brown,' she said indignantly, turning to Mr. Lorry. "'Couldn't you tell her what you had to tell her without frightening her to death? Look at her, with a pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that being a banker?' Mr. Lorry was so exceedingly disconcerted by a question so hard to answer, that he could only look on, at a distance, with much feebler sympathy and humility, while the strong woman, having banished the inn-servants under the mysterious penalty of letting them know, something not mentioned if they stayed there, staring, recovered her charge by a regular series of gradations, and coaxed her to lay her drooping head upon her shoulder. "'I hope she will be well now,' said Mr. Lorry. "'No thanks to you in brown, if she does, my darling pretty.' "'I hope,' said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, "'that you accompany Miss Manette to France?' "'A likely thing, too,' replied the young woman. "'If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, "'do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot up on an island?' "'This being another question hard to answer, "'Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew.' to consider it. 
A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Five The Jackal. Those were drinking days, and most men drank hard. So very great is the improvement time has brought about in such habits that a moderate statement of the quantity of wine and punch which one man would swallow in the course of a night without any detriment to his reputation as a perfect gentleman would seem in these days a ridiculous exaggeration. The learned profession of the law was certainly not behind any other learned profession in its bacchanalian propensities. Neither was Mr. Stryver, already fast shouldering his way to a large and lucrative practice, behind his compeers in this particular, any more than in the drier parts of the legal race. A favorite at the Old Bailey, and eke at the Sessions, Mr. Stryver had begun cautiously to hew away at the lower staves of the ladder on which he mounted. Sessions and the Old Bailey had now to summon their favorite specially to their longing arms, and, shouldering itself toward the visage of the Lord Chief Justice in the Court of King's Bench, the florid countenance of Mr. Stryver might be daily seen, bursting out of a bed of wigs like a great sunflower, pushing its way at the sun from among a rank garden full of flaring companions. It had once been noted at the bar that while Mr. Stryver was a glib man and an unscrupulous and a ready and a bold, that he had not that faculty of extracting the essence from a heap of statements, which is among the most striking and necessary of the advocate's accomplishments. But a remarkable improvement came upon him as to this. The more business he got, the greater his power seemed to grow of getting at the pith and marrow and however late at night he sat carousing with Sidney Carton, he always had his points at his finger's end in the morning. Sidney Carton, idlest and most unpromising of men, was Stryver's great ally. What the two drank together between Hillary Term and Michaelmas might have floated a king's ship. Stryver never had a case in his hand anywhere, but Carton was there with his hands in his pockets, staring at the ceiling of the court. They went to the same circuit, and even there they prolonged their usual orgies late into the night, and Carton was rumored to be seen at broad day going home stealthily and unsteadily to his lodgings like a dissipated cat. At last it began to get about, among such as were interested in the matter, that although Sidney Carton would never be a lion, he was an amazingly good jackal and that he rendered suit and service to Stryver in that humble capacity. Ten o'clock, sir,' said the man at the tavern, whom he had charged to wake him. Ten o'clock, sir. "'What's the matter? Ten o'clock, sir. "'What do you mean? Ten o'clock at night? "'Yes, sir. Your honor told me to call you. "'Oh, oh, I remember. Very well. Very well. After a few dull efforts to get to sleep again, which the man dexterously combated by stirring the fire continuously for five minutes, he got up, tossed his hat on, and walked out. He turned into the temple, and having revived himself by twice pacing the pavements of King's Bench Walk and paper buildings, turned into the Stryver Chambers. The Stryver clerk, who never assisted at these conferences, had gone home, and the Stryver principal opened the door. He had his slippers on, and a loose bedgown, and his throat was bare for his greater ease. He had that rather wild, strained, seared marking about his eyes, which may be observed in all free livers of his class, from the portrait of Jeffreys downward, and which can be traced under various disguises of art through the portraits of every drinking age. "'You're a little late, memory,' said Stryver. "'About the usual time. It may be a quarter of an hour later.' They went into a dingy room lined with books and littered with papers, where there was a blazing fire. A kettle steamed upon the hob, and in the midst of the wreck of papers a table shone with plenty of wine upon it, and brandy, and rum, and sugar, and lemons. You have had your bottle, I perceive, Sidney. Two to-night, I think. I have been dining with the day's client, or seeing him dine, it's all one. 
"'That was a rare point, Sidney, that you brought to bear upon the identification. How came you by it? When did it strike you?' "'I thought he was a rather handsome fellow, and I thought I should have been much the same sort of fellow if I'd had any luck.' Mr. Stryver laughed till he shook his precocious paunch. "'You and your luck, Sidney. Get to work. Get to work.' Sullenly enough, the jackal loosed his dress, went into an adjoining room, and came back with a large jug of cold water, a basin, and a towel or two. Steeping the towels in the water, and partially wringing them out, he folded them on his head in a manner hideous to behold, sat down at the table, and said, "'Now I am ready.' "'Not much boiling down to be done to-night, memory,' said Mr. Stryver gaily, as he looked among his papers. "'How much?' "'Only two sets of them. Give me the worst first. "'There they are, Mr. Sidney. Fire away.' "'The lion then composed himself on his back on a sofa on one side of the drinking-table, "'while the jackal sat at his own paper-bestrewn table proper, "'on the other side of it, with the bottles and glasses ready to his hand. "'Both resorted to the drinking-table without stint, but each in a different way, the lion for the most part reclining with his hands in his waistband, looking at the fire, or occasionally flirting with some lighter document. The jackal, with knitted brows and intent face so deep in his task that his eyes did not even follow the hand he stretched out for the glass, which often groped about for a minute or more before he found the glass where his lips Two or three times the matter in his hand became so knotty that the jackal found it imperative on him to get up and steep the towels anew. From these pilgrimages to the jug and basin he returned with such eccentricities of damp headgear as no words can describe, which were made more ludicrous by his anxious gravity. At length the jackal had got together a compact repast for the lion, and proceeded to offer it to him. The lion took it with care and caution, made his selections from it, and his remarks upon it, and the jackal assisted both. When the repast was fully discussed, the lion put his hands in his waistband again, and lay down to meditate. The jackal then invigorated himself with a bum for his throttle, and a fresh application to his head and applied himself to the collection of a second meal. This was administered to the lion in the same manner, and was not disposed of until the clock struck three in the morning. "'And now we have done, Sidney. Fill a bumper of punch,' said Mr. Stryver. The jackal removed the towels from his head, which had been steaming again, shook himself, yawned, shivered, and complied. You were very sound, Sidney, in the matter of the three crown witnesses to-day, every question told. I am always sound, am I not? I don't gainsay it, which has roughened your temper. Put some punch into it and smooth it again. With a deprecatory grunt, the jackal again complied. The old Sidney Carton of old Shrewsbury School, said Stryver, nodding his head over him as he reviewed him in the present and the past, the old seesaw Sidney, one minute up, down the next, now in spirits and now in despondency. Ah, returned the other, sighing, yes, the same Sidney with the same luck. Even then I did exercises for the other boys, and seldom did my own. And why not? God knows. It was my way, I suppose. He sat with his hands in his pockets and his legs stretched out before him, looking at the fire. Carton, said his friend, squaring himself at him with a bullying air as if the fire grate had been the furnace in which sustained endeavor was forged, and the one delicate thing to be done for the old Sidney Carton of old Shrewsbury School was to shoulder him into it. Your way is, and always was, a lame way. You summon no energy and purpose. Look at me. Oh, botheration, returned Sidney, with a lighter and more good-humoured laugh. Don't you be moral. How have I done what I have done? said Stryver. How do I do what I do? Partly through paying me to help you, I suppose. But it's not worth your while to apostrophize me on the air about it. 
What you want to do, you do. You were always in the front rank, and I was always behind. I had to get to the front rank. I was not born there, was I? I was not present at the ceremony, but my opinion is you were, said Carton. At this he laughed again, and they both laughed. Before Shrewsbury, and at Shrewsbury, and ever since Shrewsbury, pursued Carton, you have fallen into your rank, and I have fallen into mine. Even then we were fellow students in the student quarter of Paris, picking up French and French law and other French crumbs that we didn't get much good of. You were always somewhere, and I was always nowhere. And whose fault was that? Upon my soul, I am not sure that it was not yours. You were always driving and writhing and shouldering and passing to that restless degree that I had no chance for my life but in rust and repose. It's a gloomy thing, however, to talk about one's own past with the day breaking. Turn me in some other direction before I go. Well, then, pledge me to the pretty witness, said Stryver, holding up his glass. Are you turned in a pleasant direction? Apparently not, for he became gloomy again pretty witness, he muttered, looking down into his glass. I have had enough of witnesses to-day and to-night. Who's your pretty witness? The picturesque doctor's daughter, Miss Manette. She pretty? Is she not? No. Why, man alive, she was the admiration of the whole court. Rot the admiration of the whole court. Who made the old Bailey a judge of beauty? She was a golden-haired doll. "'Do you know, Sidney,' said Mr. Stryver, looking at him with sharp eyes and slowly drawing a hand across his florid face, "'do you know I rather thought at the time that you sympathized with the golden-haired doll, and were quick to see what happened to the golden-haired doll? Quick to see what happened. If a girl doll or no doll swoons within a yard or two of a man's nose, he can see it without a perspective glass. I pledge you, but I deny the beauty.' "'And now I'll have no more to drink. I'll get to bed.' When his host followed him out on the staircase with a candle to light him down the stairs, the day was coldly looking in through its grimy windows. When he got out of the house the air was cold and sad, the dull sky overcast, the river dark and dim, the whole scene like a lifeless desert." and wreaths of dust were spinning round and round before the morning blast, as if the desert sand had risen far away, and the first spray of it on its advance had begun to overwhelm the city. Waste forces within him, and a desert all round, this man stood still on his way to a silent terrace, and saw, for a moment lying in the wilderness before him, a mirage of honorable ambition, self-denial and perseverance. In the fair city of his vision there were airy galleries from which the loves and graces looked upon him, gardens in which the fruits of life hung ripening, waters of hope that sparkled in his sight. A moment and it was gone. Climbing to a high chamber in a well of houses, he threw himself down in his clothes on a neglected bed, and its pillow was wet with wasted tears. Sadly, sadly the sun rose. It rose upon no sadder a sight than the man of good abilities and good emotions, incapable of their directed exercise, incapable of his own help and his own happiness, sensible of the blight on him, and resigning himself to let it eat him away. Chapter Six: Hundreds of People. The quiet lodgings of Doctor Manette were in a quiet street corner not far from Soho Square. On the afternoon of a certain fine Sunday, when the waves of four months had roiled over the trial for treason and carried it, as to the public interest and memory, far out to sea, Mister Jarvis Lorry walked along the sunny streets from Clerkenwell, where he lived, on his way to dine with the doctor. After several relapses into business absorption, Mr. Lorry had become the doctor's friend, and the quiet street corner was the sunny part of his life. On this certain fine Sunday, Mr. Lorry walked towards Soho, early in the afternoon, for three reasons of habit. Firstly, because on fine Sundays he often walked out before dinner with the doctor and Lucy. 
secondly, because, on unfavorable Sundays, he was accustomed to be with them as the family friend, talking, reading, looking out of window, and generally getting through the day. Thirdly, because he happened to have his own little shrewd doubts to solve, and knew how the ways of the doctor's household pointed to that time as a likely time for solving them. A quainter corner than the corner where the doctor lived was not to be found in London. There was no way through it, and the front windows of the doctor's lodgings commanded a pleasant little vista of street that had a congenial air of retirement on it. There were few buildings then, north of the Oxford Road, and forest trees flourished and wild flowers grew, and the hawthorn blossomed in the now-vanished fields. As a consequence, country air circulated in Soho with vigorous freedom, instead of languishing into the parish like stray paupers without a settlement and there was many a good south wall not far off, on which the peaches ripened in their season. The summer light struck into the corner brilliantly in the earlier part of the day, but, when the streets grew hot, the corner was in shadow, though not in shadow so remote that you could not see beyond it into a glare of brightness. It was a cool spot, staid but cheerful, a wonderful place for echoes, and a very harbor from the raging streets. There ought to have been a tranquil bark in such an anchorage, and there was. The doctor occupied two floors of a large, stiff house, where several callings purported to be pursued by day, but whereof little was audible any day, and which was shunned by all of them at night. In a building at the back, attainable by a courtyard where a plain tree rustled its green leaves, church organs claimed to be made and silver to be chased and likewise gold to be beaten by some mysterious giant who had a golden arm starting out of the wall of the front hall as if he had beaten himself precious and menaced a similar conversion of all visitors very little of these trades or of a lonely lodger rumored to live upstairs or of a dim coach trimming maker asserted to have a counting house below was ever heard or seen occasionally a stray workman putting his coat on traversed the hall or a stranger peered about there or a distant clink was heard across the courtyard or a thump from the golden giant these however were only the exceptions required to prove the rule that the sparrows in the plane tree behind the house and the echoes in the corner before it had their own way from sunday morning unto saturday night Dr. Manette received such patience here as his old reputation, and its revival in the floating whispers of his story brought him. His scientific knowledge, and his vigilance and skill in conducting ingenious experiments, brought him otherwise into moderate request, and he earned as much as he wanted. These things were within Mr. Jarvis Lorry's knowledge, thoughts, and notice when he rang the doorbell of the tranquil house in the corner on the fine Sunday afternoon. Dr. Manette at home? Expected home. Miss Lucy at home? Expected home. Miss Pross at home? Possibly at home, but of a certainty impossible for a handmaid to anticipate intentions of Miss Pross as to admission or denial of the fact. As I am at home myself, said Mr. Lorry, I'll go upstairs. Although the doctor's daughter had known nothing of the country of her birth, she appeared to have innately derived from it that ability to make much of little means which is one of its most useful and most agreeable characteristics. Simple as the furniture was, it was set off by so many little adornments, of no value but for their taste and fancy, that its effect was delightful. The disposition of everything in the rooms, from the largest object to the least, the arrangement of colors, the elegant variety and contrast attained by thrift in trifles, by delicate hands, clear eyes, and good sense, were at once so pleasant in themselves, and so expressive of their originator, that, as Mr. Lorry stood looking about him, the very chairs and tables seemed to ask him, with something of that peculiar expression which he knew so well by this time, whether he approved. There were three rooms on a floor, and the doors by which they communicated being put open that the air might pass freely through them all, Mr. Lorry, smilingly observant of that fanciful resemblance which he detected all around him, walked from one to another. The first was the best room, and in it were Lucy's birds, and flowers, and books, and desk, and works table, and box of watercolors. The second was the doctor's consulting room, used also as the dining room. The third, changingly speckled by the rustle of the plane tree in the yard, was the doctor's bedroom. And there, in a corner, stood the disused shoemaker's bench and tray of tools much as it had stood on the fifth floor of the dismal house by the wine-shop in the suburb of saint antoine in paris 
"'I wonder,' said Mr. Lorry, pausing in his looking about, "'that he keeps that reminder of his sufferings about him.' "'And why wonder at that?' was the abrupt inquiry that made him start. It proceeded from Miss Pross, the wild red woman, strong of hand, whose acquaintance he had first made at the Royal George Hotel in Dover, and had since improved. "'I should have thought,' Mr. Lorry began. "'Pooh! You'd have thought,' said Miss Pross, and Mr. Lorry left off. "'How do you do?' inquired the lady then, sharply, and yet as if to express that she bore him no malice. "'I am pretty well, I thank you,' answered Mr. Lorry, with meekness. "'How are you?' "'Nothing to boast of,' said Miss Pross. "'Indeed?' "'Ah, indeed,' said Miss Pross. "'I am very much put out about my ladybird.' "'Indeed?' "'For gracious sake, say something else besides indeed, or you'll fidget me to death,' said Miss Pross, whose character, dissociated from stature, was shortness. "'Really, then,' said Mr. Lorry, as an amendment, "'Really is bad enough,' returned Miss Pross, "'but better. Yes, I am very much put out. "'May I ask the cause? "'I don't want dozens of people who are not all worthy of Lady Bird "'to come here looking after her,' said Miss Pross. "'Do dozens come for that purpose?' Hundreds, said Miss Pross. "'It was characteristic of this lady, "'as of some other people before her time and sense, "'that whenever her original proposition was questioned, "'she exaggerated it.' "'Dear me!' said Mr. Lorry, as the safest remark he could think of. "'I have lived with the darling, or the darling has lived with me, and paid for it, which she certainly should never have done, you may take your affidavit, if I could have afforded to keep either myself or her for nothing, since she was ten years old. And it's really very hard,' said Miss Pross. Not seeing with precision what was very hard, Mr. Lorry shook his head, using that important part of himself as sort of a fairy cloak that could fit anything. "'All sorts of people who are not in the least degree worthy of the pet "'are always turning up,' said Miss Pross. "'When you began it—' "'I began it, Miss Pross?' "'Didn't you? Who brought her father to life?' "'Oh, if that was beginning it,' said Mr. Lorry. "'It wasn't ending it, I suppose. "'I say, when you began it, it was hard enough, "'not that I have any fault to find with Dr. Manette, "'except that he is not worthy of such a daughter.' which is no imputation on him, for it was not to be expected that anybody should be, under any circumstances. But it is really doubly and trebly hard to have crowds and multitudes of people turning up after him, I could have forgiven him, to take Lady Bird's affections away from me. Mr. Lorry knew Miss Pross to be very jealous, but he also knew her by this time to be, beneath the service of her eccentricity, one of those unselfish creatures, found only among women who will, for pure love and admiration, bind themselves willing slaves, to youth when they have lost it, to beauty that they never had, to accomplishments that they were never fortunate enough to gain, to bright hopes that never shone upon their own sombre lives. He knew enough of the world to know that there is nothing in it better than the faithful service of the heart, so rendered, and so free from any mercenary taint, he had such an exalted respect for it, that in the retributive arrangements made by his own mind, we all make such arrangements, more or less, he stationed Miss Pross much nearer to the lower angels than many ladies immeasurably better got up both by nature and art, who had balances at Telson's. "'There never was nor will be but one man worthy of Ladybird,' said Miss Pross. "'And that was my brother Solomon, if he hadn't made a mistake in life. "'Here again.' Mr. Lorry's inquiries into Miss Pross's personal history had established the fact that her brother Solomon was a heartless scoundrel who had stripped her of everything she possessed, as a stake to speculate with, and had abandoned her in her poverty for evermore, with no touch of compunction. Miss Pross's fidelity of belief in Solomon, deducting a mere trifle for this slight mistake, was quite a serious matter with Mr. Lorry, and had its weight in his good opinion of her. As we happen to be alone for the moment, and are both people of business, he said, when they had got back to the drawing-room and had sat down there in friendly relations, let me ask you, does the doctor, in talking with Lucy, never refer to the shoemaking time yet? Never. And yet he keeps that bench and those tools beside him? Ah, returned Miss Pross, shaking her head, but I don't say he don't refer to it within himself. Do you believe that he thinks of it much? I do said Miss Pross. Do you imagine, Mr. Lorry had begun, when Miss Pross took him up short with, 
Never imagine anything. Have no imagination at all. I stand corrected. Do you suppose? You go so far as to suppose sometimes. Now and then, said Miss Pross. Do you suppose, Mr. Lorry went on, with a laughing twinkle in his bright eye as it looked kindly at her, that Dr. Manette has any theory of his own, preserved through all those years, relative to the cause of his being so oppressed, perhaps even to the name of his oppressor? I don't suppose anything about it but what Lady Bird tells me. And that is, that she thinks he has. Now, don't be angry at my asking all these questions, because I am a mere dull man of business, and you are a woman of business. Dull? Miss Pross inquired with placidity. Rather wishing his modest adjective away, Mr. Laura replied, No, 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 surely not. To return to business, is it not remarkable that Dr. Manette, unquestionably innocent of any crime, as we all are well assured he is, should never touch upon that question? I will not say with me, though he has had business relations with me many years ago, and we are now intimate. I will say with the fair daughter to whom he is so devotedly attached, and who is so devotedly attached to him. Believe me, Miss Pross, I don't approach the subject with you out of curiosity, but out of zealous interest. Well, to the best of my understanding, and bad's the best, you'll tell me, Miss Pross, softened by the tone of apology, he is afraid of the whole subject. Afraid? It's plain enough, I should think, why he may be. It's a dreadful remembrance. Besides that, his loss of himself grew out of it. Not knowing how he lost himself or how he recovered himself, he may never feel certain of not losing himself again. That alone wouldn't make the subject pleasant, I should think. It was a profounder remark than Mr. Lorry had looked for. True, said he, and fearful to reflect upon. Yet a doubt lurks in my mind, Miss Pross, whether it is good for Dr. Manette to have that suppression always shut up within him. Indeed, it is this doubt, and the uneasiness it sometimes causes me, that has led me to our present confidence. "'Can't be helped,' said Miss Pross, shaking her head. "'Touch that string, and he instantly changes for the worse. Better leave it alone. In short, must leave it alone, like or no. Sometimes he gets up in the dead of night, and will be heard, by us overhead there, walking up and down, walking up and down in his room. Ladybird has learnt to know then that his mind is walking up and down, walking up and down in his old prison. She hurries to him, and they go on together, walking up and down, walking up and down, until he is composed. But he never says a word of the true reason of his restlessness to her, and she finds it best not to hint at it to him. In silence they go walking up and down together, walking up and down together, till her love and company have brought him to himself. Notwithstanding Miss Pross's denial of her own imagination, there was a perception of the pain of being monotonously haunted by one sad idea in her repetition of the phrase, walking up and down, which testified to her possessing such a thing. The corner has been mentioned as a wonderful corner for echoes, and it had begun to echo so resoundingly to the tread of coming feet, that it seemed as though the very mention of that weary pacing to and fro had set it going. "'Here they are,' said Miss Pross, rising to break up the conference. "'And now we shall have hundreds of people pretty soon.' It was such a curious corner in its acoustical properties, such a peculiar ear of a place, that as Mr. Lorry stood at the open window, looking for the father and daughter whose steps he heard, he fancied they would never approach. Not only would the echoes die away, as though the steps had gone, but echoes of other steps that never came would also be heard in their stead, and would die away for good when they seemed close at hand. However, father and daughter did at last appear, and Miss Pross was ready at the street door to receive them. Miss Pross was a pleasant sight, albeit wild and red and grim, taking off her darling's bonnet when she came upstairs, and touching it up with the ends of her handkerchief, and blowing the dust off it, and folding her mantle ready for laying by, and smoothing her rich hair with as much pride as she could possibly have taken in her own hair if she had been the vainest and handsomest of women. Her darling was a pleasant sight, too, embracing her and thanking her, and protesting against her taking so much trouble for her which last she only dared to do playfully, or Miss Pross, sorely hurt, would have retired to her own chamber and cried. The doctor was a pleasant sight, too, looking on at them, and telling Miss Pross how she spoilt Lucy, in accents and with eyes that had as much spoiling in them as Miss Pross had, and would have had more if it were possible. 
Mr. Lorry was a pleasant sight, too, beaming at all of this in his wig, thanking his bachelor stars for having lighted him in his declining years to a home. But no hundreds of people came to see the sights, and Mr. Lorry looked in vain for the fulfillment of Miss Pross's prediction. Dinner time, and still no hundreds of people. In the arrangements of the little household, Miss Pross took charge of the lower regions, and always acquitted herself marvellously. Her dinners, a very modest quantity, were so well cooked, and so well served, and so neat in their contrivances, half English and half French, that nothing could be better. Miss Pross's friendship being of the thoroughly practical kind, she had ravaged Soho and the adjacent provinces in search of impoverished French, who, tempted by shillings and half-crowns, would impart culinary mysteries to her. From these decayed sons and daughters of Gaul, she had acquired such wonderful arts that the woman and girl who formed the staff of domestics regarded her as quite a sorceress, or Cinderella's godmother, who would send out for a fowl, a rabbit, a vegetable or two from the garden, and change them into anything she pleased. On Sundays, Miss Pross dined at the doctor's table, but on other days persisted in taking her meals at unknown periods, either in the lower regions, or in her own room on the second floor, a blue chamber to which no one but her ladybird ever gained admittance. On this occasion, Miss Pross, responding to Lady Bird's pleasant face and pleasant efforts to please her, unbent exceedingly, so the dinner was very pleasant, too. It was an oppressive day, and after dinner Lucy proposed that the wine should be carried out under the plane tree, and they should sit there in the air. As everything turned upon her and revolved about her, they went out under the plane tree, and she carried the wine down for the special benefit of Mr. Lorry. She had installed herself some time before as Mr. Lorry's cup-bearer, and while they sat under the plane tree talking, she kept his glass replenished. Mysterious backs and ends of houses peeped at them as they talked, and the plane tree whispered to them in its own way above their heads. Still, the hundreds of people did not present themselves. Mr. Darnay presented himself while they were sitting under the plane tree, but he was only one. Dr. Manette received him kindly, and so did Lucy. But Miss Pross suddenly became afflicted with a twitching in the head and body, and retired into the house. She was not unfrequently the victim of this disorder, and she called it, in familiar conversation, a fit of the jerks. The doctor was in his best condition, and looked specially young. The resemblance between him and Lucy was very strong at such times, and as they sat side by side, she leaning on his shoulder, and he resting his arm on the back of her chair, it was agreeable to trace the likeness. He had been talking all day on many subjects, and with unusual vivacity. "'Pray, Dr. Manette,' said Mr. Darnay, as they sat under the plane tree, and he set it to the natural pursuit of the topic in hand, which happened to be the old buildings of London. "'Have you seen much of the tower?' Lucy and I have been there, but only casually. We have seen enough of it to know that it teems with interest, little more. I have been there, as you remember, said Darnay with a smile, though reddening a little angrily, in another character, and not in a character that gives facilities for seeing much of it. They told me a curious thing when I was there. What was that? Lucy asked. In making some alterations, the workmen came up on an old dungeon, which had been, for many years, built up and forgotten. Every stone of its inner wall was covered by inscriptions which had been carved on by prisoners. Dates, names, complaints, and prayers. Upon a corner stone in an angle of the wall, one prisoner, who seemed to have gone to execution, had cut as his last work three letters. They were done with some very poor instrument, and hurriedly, with an unsteady hand. At first they were read as D. I. C. But on being more carefully examined, the last letter was found to be a G. There was no record or legend of any prisoner with those initials, and many fruitless guesses were made what the names could have been. At length it was suggested that the letters were not initials, but the complete word DIG. The floor was examined very carefully under the inscription, and in the earth beneath a stone or tile or some fragment of paving were found the ashes of a paper mingled with the ashes of a small leathern case or bag. What the unknown prisoner had written will never be read, but he had written something, and hidden it away to keep it from the gaoler. "'My father!' exclaimed Lucy. "'You are ill!' He had suddenly started up with his hand to his head. 
His manner and his look quite terrified them all. "'No, my dear, not ill. There are large drops of rain falling, and they made me start. We had better go in.' He recovered himself almost instantly. Rain was really falling in large drops, and he showed the back of his hand with raindrops on it. But he said not a single word in reference to the discovery that had been told of, and, as they walked into the house, the business eye of Mr. Lorry either detected, or fancied it detected, on his face, as it turned towards Charles Darnay, the same singular look that had been upon it when it turned towards him in the passages of the courthouse. He recovered himself so quickly, however, that Mr. Lorry had doubts of his business eye. The arm of the golden giant in the hall was not more steady than he was when he stopped under it to remark to them that he was not yet proof against slight surprises, if he ever would be, and that the rain had startled him. Tea time, and Miss Pross went to make tea, with another fit of the jerks upon her, and yet no hundreds of people. Mr. Carton had lounged in, but he made only two. The night was so very sultry, that although they sat with windows and doors open, they were overpowered by heat. When the tea-table was done with, they all moved to one of the windows and looked out into the heavy twilight. Lucy sat by her father, Darnay sat beside her, Carton leaned against a window. The curtains were long and white, and some of the thunder-gusts that whirled into the corner caught them up to the ceiling and waved them like spectral wings. The raindrops are still falling, large, heavy, and few, said Dr. Manette. It comes slowly. It comes surely, said Carton. They spoke low, as people watching and waiting mostly do, as people in a dark room, watching and waiting for lightning, always do. There was a great hurry in the streets of people speeding away to get shelter before the storm broke. The wonderful corner for echoes resounded with the echoes of footsteps coming and going, yet not a footstep was there. A multitude of people, and yet a solitude, said Darnay, when they had listened for a while. Is it not impressive, Mr. Darnay? asked Lucy. Sometimes I have sat here of an evening, until I have fancied, but even the shade of a foolish fancy makes me shudder to-night, when all is so black and solemn. Let us shudder, too. We may know what it is. It will seem nothing to you. Such whims are only impressive as we originate them, I think. They are not to be communicated. I have sometimes sat alone here of an evening, listening, until I have made the echoes out to be the echoes of all the footsteps coming by and by into our lives. There is a great crowd coming one day into our lives, if that be so, Sidney Carton struck in, in his moody way. The footsteps were incessant, and the hurry of them became more and more rapid. The corner echoed and re-echoed with the tread of feet, some, as it seemed, under the windows, some, as it seemed, in the room, some coming, some going, some breaking off, some stopping altogether, all in the distant streets, and not one within sight. Are all these footsteps destined to come to all of us, Miss Manette? Are we to divide them among ourselves? I don't know, Mr. Darnay. I told you it was a foolish fancy, but you asked for it. When I have yielded myself to it, I have been alone, and then I have imagined them the footsteps of people who are to come into my life and my father." I take them into mine, said Carton. I ask no questions and make no stipulations. There's a great crowd bearing down upon us, Miss Manette, and I see them by the lightning. He added the last words, after there had been a vivid flash which had shown him lounging in the window. And I hear them, he added again, after a peal of thunder. Here they come, fast, fierce, and furious. It was the rush and roar of rain that he typified, and it stopped him, for no voice could be heard in it. A memorable storm of thunder and lightning broke with that sweep of water, and there was not a moment's interval in crash and fire and rain, until after the moon rose at midnight. The great bell of St. Paul's was striking one in the cleared air when Mr. Lorry, escorted by Jerry, high-booted and wearing a lantern, set forth on his return passage to Clerkenwell. There were solitary patches of road on the way between Soho and Clerkenwell, and Mr. Lorry, mindful of footpads, always retained Jerry for this service, though it was usually performed a good two hours earlier. "'What a night it has been, almost a night, Jerry,' said Mr. Lorry, to bring the dead out of their graves. "'I never see the night myself, Master, nor yet I don't expect to. What would do that?' answered Jerry. "'Good night, Mr. Carton,' said the man of business. "'Good night, Mr. Darnay. Shall we ever see such a night again together?' "'Perhaps.' 
perhaps see the great crowd of people with its rush and roar bearing down upon them too 